The American philosopher Mark Twain once quipped, there are lies, damn lies, and statistics. And in our everyday news cycle, there is the chance to hear lots of numbers that may ultimately mislead us. One way to make sense of those numbers is to take a closer look at the lives of the people that those numbers represent. Enter inclusion reporting. Two people are here to talk with us today about a deeply meaningful project that digs behind the statistics of life at the margins. They are Mariano Avila of WGVU, the local PBS affiliate, and Michael Walenta, general manager of WGVU Public Media. Gentlemen, thanks for joining us today. Well, thanks for having us. We appreciate it. Yeah. Mariano, I'd like to start with you. Your, you bring to the job a bilingual, bicultural perspective, but I'd like you to tell us a little bit about your itinerant beginnings, your, your roots. Um, well, I'm, like most Mexicans, the product of the mixture of indigenous people groups. In my case, I believe I have Aztec and Zapotec blood, and the Spanish, uh, which that's a whole mixture of Catalan, uh, Basque, uh, Castilian, Galician. So there's a lot of, and within that, because of a 400-year occupation, there's also Arab and Jewish blood, and you really can't tell which one you have. It's very difficult for us mestizos, uh, what we call ourselves. And so I was born and raised in Mexico, jumping around within the United States and Mexico, and that's where I learned English. Um, but certainly Spanish is my first language. And then in growing up, you really spent time on both sides of the border, correct? Yes, uh, my dad was very fond of studying. And so uh, I was born and he came here to get an advanced ministry degree uh, called a THM at Calvin Seminary. And we stayed here till I was about three. We moved back to Mexico. He decided to get a PhD. We went to Philly. He got another master's, and then we went back to Mexico to do a second PhD. Um, stayed there till he got a job in Miami when I was about 20, and then we followed him. Eventually made it here for college. Sure. And I say we because my brother and I both, you know, followed him around. So. Mm -hmm. Sure. Michael, uh, Mariano is really your boots on the ground for an important partnership with the Kellogg Foundation. Correct. Can you tell us about that? Well, we, we've been trying to do a number of different partnerships. This is the one that really stuck, and we went after this mutual inclusive opportunity. So we talked to Kellogg. They were very much in, in favor of it. So we were able to secure a two-year grant uh, to get a reporter and to get a part-time producer. So Mariano, the reporter, host of the program, and then we have a producer. Noel's our producer for it. So talk about the parameters of the program. Regarding? Mutually inclusive. Well, when I... At my level, when I sat down with our, the project officer from uh, Kellogg, they said, you know, and this is not to be a, uh, offensive to companies, but some companies who are big enough can kind of buy their way out of a problem, if you will. If they don't have enough uh, uh, equity in the workforce, they can kind of buy that solution. They For example? They wanted to make sure, well, um, if you don't have enough minority Pacific, Pacific, if there was an issue in West Michigan, let's just say um, it came out there's not enough Native Americans in the workforce. If you're a big enough company, we'll, we'll pick a big one far away, Microsoft, they could just go out and they could afford to actually send them to college, put them on a scholarship, give them an internship, put them on the workforce, problem solved. Whether they're good or not, they could do, I'm sure there's a lot of very good ones, but they could solve the problem. If you're a little tiny company, you don't have those resources. You got everybody that can do the work, you can't get to all the job fairs, you can't do all these other things. But we were told, we don't want to go to the top tier, we don't want to go to the middle tier, we want you to go to the third tier, we want you to go to these organizations that are really boots on the ground, these little teeny tiny one or two person grassroots trying to solve these real little tiny problems. That's where we really want you to focus on. So small that you might not even know about it because they don't even have the money to get the word out about what they're working on. But yet what they do when you hear the story is a very compelling story. I'll give you a little example. It's not quite right because it didn't quite happen in Grand Rapids. Mariano knows. I was over in, uh, near Birch Run, uh, the, the discount mall last winter and it was a terribly snowy day. It had snowed the night before. I was actually on my way to a ski patrol meeting. I pulled off the exit to stop at a uh, a burger joint, a heavily franchised burger operation seen throughout the world. And there was a woman and a man standing on the corner panhandling. 
and and it, it's snowing. You can't keep the snow off your windshield. I looked at them. You know, they've got their backpacks with them, and I, and I rolled down the window. I said, I'm not going to give you any money, but if you want, you walk down there to that place, and I'll buy you lunch, cause I, and I want to talk to you about your story. And I knew they were taking care of each other. They were a couple together, and they came down. I, I bought a lunch, and we chatted. What had happened was their, their place they were renting burned down. They got enough assistance for a few days, but to renew the assistance and go to the next level, they have to mail it to you. They don't have a house. Ergo, right. they don't have a mailbox. Ergo, they can't get to the next level. They are out on the street through really no fault of their own, trying to integrate back into society, but because of a couple of rules that they couldn't get around, they're kind of stuck. They could get this car, they could get that car, they had a cell phone, but they couldn't get back on their feet because they didn't have a house because it had burned to the ground. So that's a real, so imagine if I was just one person working in that area trying to help those people get back up on their feet. That's what I mean by that real small thing. Came back, told Mariano, we had their phone number, we never could connect with them again. We wanted to really go in depth. We mm -hmm. wanted to go to them. That's what I mean about that really small story. But some of these stories are so small, I don't know them all. Mariano knows a lot, and we encourage everyone to call him, tell him a story. And some people, because of their situation, they're, what, reserved would be the right word? Shy, for sure. Yeah. Shy, reserved, maybe embarrassed. They don't want people to know who they are. Sure. They don't want to get there. But yet, we're trying to dig in to get the story to help everybody. It might not help them, but maybe it'll help the next person or that next group, or maybe get some things resolved. So, you know, just by telling that story, maybe there's people out there going, oh, yeah, if your house burns down. Well, it makes you realize mailbox. that there are cracks to fall through that we didn't even knew, didn't even know existed. And, you know, how many other people in comparable situations have these? So, you know, housing, you know, for one. Right, and we were ready to put our resources behind it to say, okay, we'll see if we can help you. But for some reason, whatever reason, we never could get them to call us back. We left a number of messages for whatever reason, maybe they just decided, no, they wanted to do it their own way. They were very proud when I talked to them. They didn't want any handouts, but again, they didn't, they barely had enough money for a hotel room that night. They knew they couldn't stay out. It was that 30 degree wet, heavy, yeah. extremely hypothermic snow, very, very dangerous conditions. They were trying to get enough money to get a room for that night. Yeah, sure, sure. Mariano, there's this myth that America is across the board a land of opportunity. And we understand that there are disparities out there. What has your work uncovered in, in, along those lines? Well, I'll talk about the three shows that we've done so far. The first one was talking about um, the disparities just between men and women. And as a man, it was very difficult for me to say, what is the worst form of disparity? So I asked Noel, uh, who Michael referenced, she's our producer uh, for Mutually Inclusive, and I said, look, I can't tell you what the worst form of, of male, female disparities are. What do you think is the worst form? She said sex trafficking. So we, I, I mean, I was not prepared to do that at that time. I was like, wow, this is the first show. Okay, we'll do it. And so we learned a lot about that. The second one, uh, that one we would prepared a little bit more for, and what we wanted to do was infant mortality among African Americans in some areas in West Michigan specifically it can be three to four times higher. Um, and so we focused on Kalamazoo and found that there was a woman at Western Michigan who had done research on adjusting for uh, income, health, country of origin or region of origin, all sorts of different factors that we would say, well, are they teen pregnancies? No. Are they poor? No. Are they educated? And what she said, and this is a white woman saying this, we have found that it is systemic racism that is creating toxic stress, meaning that you can't get rid of it. There's no way to escape this stress because it's with you everywhere. In black women, and no matter what income level or education level they have, that stress goes with them, and it's creating twice the risk for poor birth outcomes. And if you've got poverty and other issues like that to deal with, then it's three to four times the risk. And so finding out that there's actually data pointing to systemic racism having direct effects on, on baby's health and chance for survival. That to me was mind blowing. And it was a completely new thing for me. The last one that we did was on sexual health among minorities. And that's, that was a question. We realized that there were um, kind of an epidemic of gonorrhea and chlamydia in some counties in Western Michigan, not in others. And we started to dig into why. This is not from me. This is what health workers and sex educators told us. 
if you're in the sex, I mean, the public school system, depending on what they choose for your sex education, that will determine your odds of getting an STD if you're in certain communities. And so if you have a heavily African-American population in a county where they've decided to have abstinence only or abstinence-based sex education, your chances for teen pregnancy or STDs skyrockets compared to another area where you might have comprehensive sex education, same population have better uh, health, sexual health outcomes. So those are some of the things that we've uncovered that I've learned, and I, uh, this is not just me digging into one issue knowing what the answer is. I, I started out asking why are these numbers higher? And then it, they led us down in a legislative track, really, because it ends up with legislators saying this is what you have to teach. Because ultimately it's, it's policy that's influencing people's lives you know, at the, at the, in the grassroots. Absolutely. Right, right. Michael, thinking about um, your, you've just started this program with, with, with Kellogg. Right. And it's, it's a, a two-year uh, arrangement. Correct. Where do you see this going you know, further? Because you've, you've been in the business a long time. What are the what are the possibilities for you know for continuing for expanding um, this this kind well, of? Well, I think it's really good. I, basically, our model um, we, uh, KPBS out in uh, San Diego is uh, Tom Carlo is the general manager I know very well, and I, I talked to him. We were trying to figure out how to kind of reinvent WGVU again. We've been around since 1972, and what they had done is what we're now trying to do. Mutually inclusive is really our first effort to that. But they've got a whole staff of reporters now, which they have gone out and they've said, okay, you know, these are the key areas we want to focus on. Then they would go do fundraising for a three-year commitment for that position, fund it as it, the position would move along. People would get interested in all the stories. What can we do to help? Well, we need to fund this position and get more grant funding. That was funded. They'd go to the next, go to the next. We've got 20 positions worked out. We just need the funding for them. Mariano's uh, contract uh, the first year is, uh, I think, October 1? Yeah. So, as the end of year one, so already we're coming up on that date. So we've got to see how we're going to fund that after the second year so we can keep this going long term. Hopefully enough people see there's a need, they want to help support it, we'll help support it, and it will go on, and it starts to become a legacy unto itself. Sure. Um, we have to wrap up in a minute here, but uh, Mariano, you and I were talking earlier about uh, immigrants, and the, and the focus of the show is on you know, how do you create a place of, of welcome and belonging when you're not from there originally? But you, you had a really good observation that there are immigrants and there are immigrants, and there are immigrants of privilege and without privilege. And could you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. So I think when people say immigrant, and especially in the political climate that we're in right now, people think of migrant workers. And that's the hardest form of migration. It's really hard to get here. I mean, it can take you months just to travel here. And the, I hate to say it, but Mexico, where I'm from, is the worst for immigrants. It's really dangerous to get through Mexico if you're not from there to get to the United States. And it's uh, a life risk. It's, there's you know, all sorts of violence going on there. My story is not that story. My story is my father has you know, a couple of PhDs. I traveled here with him and then eventually got an H-1B visa, which is a very hard visa to get and then married an American, which made it easier for me to stay here um, and get a, what's called a green card. Uh, that, though, even though it was very easy compared to what some of the other folks that we think of when we say immigrants in the United States went through, my story took, what, 10 years and about $20,000 of attorney's fees just to stay in line. And again, I came in with a, a father who was highly educated, was asked to be here, they paid for our way as a family to, to move here. And all of those steps of getting from moving out of my parents' unit to becoming my own you know, person through the years cost about $20,000 in attorney's fees and immigration fees plus a 10-year wait. So, I mean, yeah, it's not easy or hard depending on how you look at it, but it's certainly a trajectory that is a lot harder than I think people expect. They're like, oh, you just get in line and then you get your number. It's not like that at all. So there's a lot of 
misinformation or misunderstanding among the non-immigrant population about how that happens. Absolutely, and yeah. I think, to be fair, if, if your ancestors came here, you know, and you were European, you know, 150 years ago, they came through Ellis Island, they signed some documents, they probably got some wonky variation on their name, but that was about the extent of it, and then you were an American citizen. If you are Hispanic now, chances are your country does not qualify for a lottery, which means you have to go through one of two avenues, well, three avenues, really. You marry an American, you get uh, an H-1B, which is high skill, or you get an investor visa, which means you have to invest a million dollars or something in, in the United States. Now, I'm not an immigration attorney, but you know, I've been around this stuff. My brother is. You should talk to him about the specifics. But it's really difficult to migrate now. And again, even doing all of the things that you have to do and T's and I's crossed and dotted, um, $20,000 10 years later. Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll need to continue this conversation another time, but I want to thank you for coming by and maybe um, propose that some of your future uh, uh, reporting uh, include uh, immigrants to this community because it's a, it's a ripe uh, population for, for working with and uh, lots going on there too. We absolutely do. Okay, awesome. Thanks for having us. We appreciate thanks, it. Thanks for coming so much. And for people watching at home, stay tuned. We'll be back in a moment with some tips on American culture, American English, and a little bit of American humor. Really interesting because he was on the second to last American cargo flight out uh, before the fall of Saigon on April 30th, 1975. So he was very fortunate to be able to get out. My mother, on the other hand, didn't come to the United States until 1979, um, and she came as a boat person. So similar to what you see with a lot of refugees today,